the rest of the story. Hi, everybody. I think we should uh, get started. I'm John Morgan. I'm director of the Center for Science Writings. And thank you very much for coming to our last event of the semester. Uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I've got a few announcements to make. Uh, last month, unfortunately, we had to cancel a talk on quantum entanglement by the science writer Louisa Gilder because she came down with the flu at the last minute. Uh, but we've rescheduled her for April 7th, so mark that in your calendars. We have two other uh, talks scheduled for this spring. On February 17th, the anthropologist Ryan Ferguson of uh, Rutgers will talk about the biological underpinnings of violence, which is a topic that I'm really interested in myself. Uh, on March 10th, Jonathan Marino, who's an ethicist at the University of Pennsylvania, will, will reveal how the military is trying to exploit brain research to create bionic soldiers. So that should be a really good one, too. Also, I'm still looking <coughs> for nominations for next year's Green Book Award, which honors books with an environmental theme. The award includes a prize of $5,000 sponsored by Turner Construction, the biggest builder in the world. You can contact me and learn more about all our CSW events by going to our website, stevens.edu slash CSW. OK, so now for our uh, future presentation. Today is Darwin Day at Stevens. How many of you knew it was Darwin Day today? That's, okay, that's not bad. Better than I expected, actually. Um, so we're celebrating the 100th, 150th anniversary of the greatest book ever written on the origin of species. It's also Darwin's 200th birthday. Bob Wright, our speaker today, is the perfect Darwin Day speaker because he's one of the world's most influential Darwinian thinkers. I've known Bob since the late 1980s, when he married a childhood friend of mine. When I first met Bob, he struck me as a real know-it-all. Can I just go right to the talk? This is the best part. Bob had strong opinions. This is typical. <laughs> Interrupting. Bob had strong opinions about science, religion, philosophy, politics, everything. If you dared to disagree with him, you were in for some real intellectual hardball. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, can't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure Bob and I argued the first time we met, and we've been arguing ever since. <coughs> Bob doesn't always change my mind. In fact, he I don't think he ever has. <laughs> but he does always force me to re-examine my own beliefs. This can be annoying, but it's also a talent that I great, greatly admire. When I read Bob's first book, Three Scientists and Their Gods, in 1988, I was dismayed because it was so good in style and substance. It really set the, the bar very high for other science writers like me. Bob didn't just report on scientist research, he offered his own interpretation of it, which was often more original and compelling than that of the scientists. Three scientists sounded just like Bob. Very smart, funny, opinionated, and obsessed with making sense of things. These qualities animate all of Bob's writings. Bob's second book, The Moral Animal, published 15 years ago, shows how evolutionary theory can help us understand human nature at its best and worst. Moral Animal remains the best case ever made for evolutionary psychology, better than anything by mere scientists. It's worth reading just for Bob's Darwinian analysis of Darwin's own behavior. In his 2000 book, Non-Zero, Bob analyzes the entire history of life and human history from the perspective of game theory as well as evolutionary theory. He concludes that maybe, 
just maybe, humanity isn't doomed. <laughs> Bob's latest book, The Evolution of God, which he's going to talk about today, has kicked up quite a kerfuffle. Bob has been attacked both by atheists and by some religious believers, which tells me that he must be doing something right. Just last week, the New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof praised Bob for finding a middle ground between, quote, religious intolerance and irreligious intolerance. <coughs> Bob has a very fancy resume. He graduated from Princeton, where he studied under the legendary science writer John McPhee. He's been editor-in-chief of the New Republic and a columnist for the New York Times. He has taught at Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania. He's been interviewed by Bill Moyers, Stephen Colbert, Charlie Rose. He's won many prizes, including a National Magazine Award for Essay and Criticism. The New York Times named The Moral Animal one of the 10 best books of the year, and Bill Clinton, no less, has called Non-Zero one of his favorite books. Bob also founded Blogging Heads TV, a popular internet salon on current affairs. I am privileged, and I mean that be a science correspondent for Blogging Heads TV. But here's what impresses me most about Bob. His goal is nothing less than figuring out the meaning of life. Not just for Bob, but for all the rest of us. Bob and I, of course, have argued about this because I don't think life has any intrinsic meaning. But if anyone can figure out the meaning of life, Bob can. We have copies of The Evolution of God for sale here today, and I'm sure that Bob, after his talk is done, would be delighted to sign them. So please give my friend Bob Wright a warm welcome to Stevens. Thank you, John, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, that was a much uh, less damaging introduction than I had envisioned, actually. And John has known me long enough so that he has uh, information about me that could be put to uh, destructive use. But then again, I have some information about me. It's kind of uh, what, what the nuclear strategists call a stable deterrence uh, situation of uh, mutually assured destruction. Um, so thank you. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the book. This is the book. Um, my, my publisher and I had a little disagreement about whose name should be Bigger, Minor, God. Uh, <laughs> mine, is, mine is the one down here. Um, publisher one. Um, and I've got some bad news for those of you who are here because of, it's Darwin Day uh, and who, who might have believed what John said about my being the ideal speaker for Darwin Day, which is that the term evolution in the title refers mainly to cultural evolution, not biological evolution, which is to say uh, the evolution of things like art, technology, ideas, um, including ideas about God. So uh, one thing I do is trace uh, our human thinking about God uh, all the way from hunter-gatherer days, um, back when, uh, so far as we can tell, um, Every, every society on the face of the earth thought that there was more than one God. They were all polytheistic. Um, I, I trace the story forward and then, and then focus in particular on uh, the development of monotheism and the Abrahamic religions. That is to say, the emergence uh, of monotheism in ancient Israel and, and eventually of, of Judaism. Um, the emergence of Christianity and the emergence of Islam. Um, that's probably the heart of the book, is, is about the Abrahamic religions and, and, and how they pass through these, these uh, key thresholds. Now, I tell the story uh, kind of from the outside, you might say. That is, I'm not a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, um, and I'm not an adherent of any other conventional religion. Um, on the other hand, I'm not an atheist, and I wouldn't even say uh, I'm, I'm an agnostic. So the obvious question is, what am I? Uh, and I'm going to leave you in suspense on, on, on that question. Um, the, uh, I know John has his ideas about what I am, I think. I still don't know. You do? Well, good. Okay. Um, so uh, 
I hope that, that, that kind of the answer will unfold in the course of this. If it fails to, if I don't get around to this, feel free during the Q&A to just stand up and say, what are you? And, and uh, I will owe you an answer of some kind. Um, the, uh, the, the question of what I am, that is what I believe, is, is rooted in the so-called science and religion question. In other words, what can a person who... Uh, who basically buys a scientific worldview have in the way of religious beliefs, you know. Um, to what extent can religion and science be reconciled? And that's one of the two contemporary themes my book addresses. The book is largely takes place in the ancient world, but there are two contemporary themes that I focus on. One is the science and religion question, uh, and the other is the, the question of whether the Abrahamic religions can get along with one another question that's become especially acute since 9-11. Uh, so you might say that the two contemporary themes are, can science and religion be reconciled, and can the Abrahamic religions be reconciled? I'm going to talk mainly about things that are, that are directly relevant to that second question today, about uh, the, the Abrahamic religions. Um, but in the background, we'll be hovering this kind of science and religion question, um, and it will come up near the end, I hope. And in any event, I'm very open to addressing that in, uh, in, in the question and answer uh, uh, session. Okay, so in the beginning, there were all these uh, hunter-gatherer uh, societies, which again, as so far as we can tell, were polytheistic. Um, religion back then seems to have not been what, what we think of as religion today. Today we associate religion with, in particular, moral behavior and the encouragement uh, of moral behavior. Religion doesn't seem to have started out uh, about that. It seems to have started out as a way to figure out why good things happen and bad things happen, you know, why horrible storms happen and disease happen, uh, and why times of plenty happen and why victory and war happen and so on, um, and come up with explanations of why these things had happened as a way of figuring out what to do to increase the number of good things that happen and decrease the number of bad things. So it, it consisted of, of coming up with theories uh, about why, why good things and bad things happen. And invariably, these theories involve the positing of these beings, these supernatural beings, that were a lot like humans psychologically. Okay? They were just, you know, they were like invisible or something. They were different from humans in a way. But fundamentally, their psychology was always like humans. So. Um, if something horrible happened to your society, the, the natural inference was you had done something that angered or offended one of these beings. And if something good happened, it meant you had done something uh, to please them. Okay, because they were, they were like people. They, they, that was the theory, you know. If you, if, you, if you get them upset, they will punish you. Um, but, but again, there wasn't a strong moral dimension in our sense of the word because the theories about what things gratify the gods and what things upset the gods were not theories about, uh, you know, it, it wasn't things like, um, well, you, you committed adultery or you stole something from your neighbor or you killed your neighbor. It wasn't, it wasn't what we would call moral transgressions that were generally the problem. It was more things like, uh, you know, ritual transgressions or, or you know, things like, uh, you know, you uh, in one society, in one contemporary or uh, recently observed hunter-gatherer society, the idea was, you know, if, if you watch a dog's mate, that is an infraction that will lead to a horrible storm. It, it, was, it was, or if you comb your hair during a thunderstorm, that was another example. That's like a bad idea. So it's things that we would call um, superstitions. As time wears on, um, you, you do, and society kind of evolves from the hunter-gatherer stage toward what we would call modern society, you start getting a strong moral dimension in, in uh, religion. And the other thing that happens uh, in the part of the world that I focus on is you get monotheism. So in a way, my book is telling uh, the story of a, uh, of, of, a, of, of a a movement from a kind of amoral polytheism towards what you could call a, a moral, in some sense of the word, um, monotheism. Uh, and um, the explanation for why things don't start out with a strong moral dimension, by the way, is just that in a hunter-gatherer society, you don't need the encouragement of religious incentives to keep people behaving <clears throat> fairly nicely towards one another. That is, everyone, it's a small society, everyone knows everyone else. Uh, 
there are a lot of modern crimes that just are intrinsically hard to get away with. I mean, a problem, if you want to be a thief in a hunter-gatherer society, you have two problems. One, there's almost nothing to steal. The other, there's, there's nowhere to hide it. So um, you don't really, uh, you don't need the kinds of strictures um, that we see in, in, in religion at that level of social organization. But as you, as you get the invention of agriculture, larger societies, religion does start to acquire um, a, a moral dimension. And so, as I said, I'm telling a story that goes from an amoral polytheism to a moral, in some sense, monotheism. I want to emphasize there's two things I'm not saying here. I'm not saying that polytheism is intrinsically amoral. In fact, uh, the polytheistic societies, as they grow larger in social, or, you know, as they approach more expansive social organization, chiefdoms, ancient states, and so on, you start seeing uh, these kinds of moral rules, in our sense of the term, enforced by the religion. And I'm also not saying monotheism is this intrinsically moral thing. Uh, you know, if you can, you need only look at the Hebrew Bible or uh, parts of the New Testament um, to see that. There's a famous uh, in case in, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy where God says that you should, if there's a neighboring society that has the wrong religious beliefs, you, can, you should kill all men, women, um, and children. And that's you know part of the monotheistic uh, scripture. Um, so in other words, uh, you know, in in a monotheistic tradition, this is this is one sign that in the monotheistic tradition, God has kind of moods. Sometimes in the scriptures, God is in a good mood. Sometimes God is in a bad mood. And one thing I wanted to do with the book was try to explain the moods. You know, what was it that inclined the writers of Scripture to interpret God at one point as being belligerent and another point as, as being nicer? And you see this in all the Abrahamic Scriptures. So, um, in the Quran, at one point, you see God counseling Muslims to say to non-believers, you've got your religion, we've got our religion, can't we get along? At other times, you see God saying, uh, you know, you should, you should kill people who, who are not believers. Um, uh, so too in the uh, in the in the Bible, sometimes you have verses like the one I just cited in Deuteronomy. Uh, but there are other other cases where, uh, for example, um, the ancient Israelites are dealing with a neighboring people, and they not only uh, argue for peaceful coexistence, but they actually invoke the neighboring God to validate this relationship of peaceful coexistence. So the Israelites say to these neighboring people, "Look, you've got your God Chemosh, we've got our God Yahweh." Your God gave you your land, our God gave us our land, can't we get along? So you have, in, in the Quran and the Bible, you have these nice verses, you have these not so nice verses. I was interested in the question uh, of, of why, uh, why you have the vacillation. And the, and the reason I'm interested in the, in the question is because of the, the contemporary application. Uh, that is to say, why do people today sometimes interpret their scripture as counseling belligerence and sometimes as counseling tolerance? That's a very important question in the modern world. Um, I will say uh, a little bit about that as I go on, but I want to stop now and emphasize that I do think the place to look for the answer is in the circumstances of the people who are doing the interpreting of the scripture. Okay, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I don't think that any religion is intrinsically belligerent or intrinsically tolerant. I think scriptures tend to have a menu of options and interpretations that believers can choose from. And the question I'm interested in is why do people choose one interpretation one time, one inter interpretation um, another? Why now are the people, some people saying jihad means I should go kill so and so, other people saying jihad refers to an internal struggle, not, not, not to violence. Um, and I'm arguing that the answer you find in the ancient world is, 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 is the same as the one today. In other words, those circumstances that inclined ancient writers of scripture to write belligerent scriptures would be the kinds of circumstances that encourage uh, belligerent interpretation of scripture today. Um, and uh, I, the, the answer I come up with is pretty simple. Um, you know, all, maybe embarrassingly simple, maybe, maybe too obvious, but the argument I make in the book is that uh, when a group of believers see the possibility of constructive coexistence with another group of people, then they are more likely to interpret their, their scripture tolerantly. And when, on the other hand, they see 
intrinsic conflict uh, or intense competition with a neighboring group, they're less likely to see tolerance in their scripture and more likely to see belligerence. Now, I, um, I kind of dress this up in fancy uh, theoretical language in the, in the book, and let me just give you a, in the, in the language of game theory, and, and probably some of you are a little rusty in your game theory, so let me just give you a, a, a little, um, uh, a little uh, refresher course. It's, it's very simple. It's just two terms, non-zero-sum game, zero-sum game. A zero-sum game is the kind you're all familiar with. In tennis, say, so that uh, if you're playing somebody in tennis, every point is good for one of you and bad for the other. Uh, so that your fortunes are always inversely correlated, so they kind of add up to zero, that's why it's a zero-sum game. Um, on the other hand, if you're playing doubles, and the person on your side of the net, uh, their fortunes are, are entirely correlated with yours. So every point is either good for both of you or bad for both of you. That's a highly non-zero-sum game, because the sum of your fortunes is never zero. It's either positive or negative. Um, and in real life, uh, the situation is rarely that Clear cut, but there are both zero sum and non zero sum situations. If you're in, a, if you're a rival with someone for something, there's only one of a job, a mate. That's a zero sum situation. Um, if you engage in commerce with someone, that's usually a non zero sum situation. So if you go buy something at a store, um, it means that you would rather have the merchandise than the money. The merchant would rather have the money. You both feel you've come out ahead. That's non zero sum. Uh, if you're allies in a war or something, that's non-zero sum. Any degree of correlation between your fortunes, uh, positive correlation, make, makes it a non-zero sum um, relationship. And so I'm just, um, I, you know, I, I'm saying what I hope is kind of obvious. If, if you look at your own lives, um, I hope you will agree that if you see someone, um, and there's a prospect for collaboration. Say they're in the same line of work or something, and it looks like you two can collaborate productively. I contend that you naturally, without even thinking about it, are going to start judging them leniently and, and just sizing them up favorably along various dimensions. You want to think good things about them because thinking that is more likely to lead to a relationship, a constructive relationship with you. <clears throat> Whereas I contend, if you have a rival, Let's say you're competing with someone for a mate or a job. Um, probably all of us are familiar with, with at least one of those. Um, I contend that without even thinking about it, you just start sizing them up unfavorably, judging them uncharitably. Whether it's a taste in music, say you're, you're competing for the same mate, whatever you hear about this rival's taste in music or art or politics, you're probably going to think of a way to frame it negatively. Now, does this ring true with anyone? Thank you. The most honest person in the room. Are there are there people it just doesn't you think you're you're not this bad? John, you don't think you're not this bad, right? No, I'm a, I'm a real Buddhist. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, this is just a, a tribute to the power of self-deception. Um, um, we all like to think that we're very good, but but I maintain that there is this this dynamic, and, and I think. Here's some real evolution, biological evolution. I think we're talking about a mechanism that, a psychological mechanism that natural selection designed into us to facilitate the playing of zero-sum and non-zero-sum games, to, to help nurture friendships and alliances on the one hand and help us to compete effectively against rivals by undermining them, saying negative things about them, believing negative things about them. Somebody's shaking your head. That's a bad sign. Um, we will not be calling on her in the Q&A. <laughs> Not a non zero sum relationship. <laughs> um, so, anyway, my, my point is that this psychological mechanism, which seems to me very simple uh, and maybe obvious, has shaped a lot of religious history. These bursts of belligerence in a religion, these, these, these uh, welcome uh, bursts of tolerance, often come down to whether a group perceives itself as having uh, the potential to engage in a non zero sum relationship with another group. Another, and I think you see this in the uh, in all the scriptures. Again, um, take the Quran for example. Uh, it's common to read on right wing web websites the horrible things that Muhammad says about Christians and Jews in the Quran, or as Muslims would have it, things that God says through Muhammad um, in the Quran. But uh, in either event, it's true that there are these horrible things. It's also true that there are these wonderful things. 
Okay? He says Jesus is the Word of God. Um, Jesus is the Spirit of God. says wonderful things about Mary. Um, he uh, says that the Hebrews are God's chosen people. Um, he, he, for a time, has Muslims observing uh, Yom Kippur, uh, praying toward uh, Jerusalem instead of Mecca. Um, these are the times when he thinks he can, so to speak, do business with these people. He thinks it's possible to bring them into a common faith, or you might say a common political coalition, because after all, he was a politician as well as a prophet. But in any event, he sees the prospects for future for, for fruitful collaboration with him. When he doesn't, you see uh, much, much more of all the negative things you can read on, on the right-wing um, websites. Uh, I think you see um, a very similar dynamic uh, in in the uh, in in the Old Testament or or what uh, uh, the, the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, um, where the vacillations uh, in attitudes toward neighboring peoples can be explained in terms of, of how the prospects for collaboration with them are perceived. So, and this explains why God is it for a while and. <clears throat> seemingly in really bad mood, gets in a better mood. And I want to emphasize, I'm not talking here about the old idea that the Old Testament God is this mean God and then you get this nice God. In the New Testament, I'm talking entirely within the Old Testament. I think you can see changes in the mood of God uh, that are explained in these terms. And that, again, I think helps shed light on the modern world because we're, what we're seeing is the dynamic that will shape the attitudes of modern-day believers um, against each other. Now, um, I don't want to talk too, too long, but uh, let me uh, run you through a little bit of, of kind of um, theological history to, that I think is evident in the Old Testament. Um, I argue in the book that uh, monotheism doesn't show up until much later than is conventionally believed. I mean, the standard story in the Bible is that you know Moses is a monotheist. The <clears throat> standard belief is Abraham was a monotheist. So it's kind of with the Israelites from the very beginning. Um, <laughs> And that any departures from that on the part of individual Israelites are, you know, are kind of temporary, and and, uh, and the main story is monotheism. I think you don't get true monotheism until the exile uh, of the Israelites in the sixth uh, century BCE, the early sixth century, when they are exiled to Babylon after the Babylonians conquered the Israelites. Um, and in terms of telling this story. This, this, this explanation of uh, what puts God in a, in a good mood and a bad mood is, is kind of central. Because in my telling, uh, I said earlier, I'm not saying monotheism is intrinsically a moral or, or good thing. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite during this phase of history. I argue that you go from a, a, a tolerant polytheism in ancient Israel to a quite intolerant and belligerent monotheism uh, at the birth of monotheism. But then and this is, again, long before Jesus in the New Testament, then I think you get a more tolerant form of monotheism after the exile. So let me just run you through a little of that logic um, to give you the idea of, uh, of what I'm talking about. So, as I said, you know, the Bible acknowledges these departures from uh, monotheism, and one thing it, it acknowledges um, is that King Solomon was very welcoming to foreign gods. Um, and this is kind of an awkward fact for uh, the... the, the uh, authors and latter-day editors of the Bible, I would say, and they have an explanation for it. They blame it on his wives, okay? They say the problem is he had all these foreign wives, and they, you know, they led him to stray from the one true God and, uh, and, and build, tolerate altars to their gods or whatever. Well, it's true that he apparently had a lot of wives. I think the number is 700, which even by, I don't know, by anyone's standard, that's a lot of wives. Um, <laughs> And uh, so let's accept that as the truth. So we do have a correlation then between number of, of wives and number of gods respected by Solomon, but I think the Bible has the logic backwards. I, 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 and here, here's what I mean by that. In, the, in ancient times, if, if a king married lots of foreign women, it was a way of consolidating relationships with nearby nations, okay? So it was part of what you could call an internationalist foreign policy. Or foreign policy characterized by seeing non-zero-sum relationships with, with nearby nations. You, you know, you think you can profit by doing business. You want to stand in terms with them. You marry uh, the wives of, uh, or the the, uh, the daughters and relatives of their kings, and so on. You consolidate ties. Well, it's also the case 
that the reason you would worship foreign gods is to consolidate those same ties. Okay? So I don't think it's a case that the wives just happened to convince him to worship uh, the gods of their native land. I think King Solomon had an internationalist foreign policy. Uh, that is, he saw things as non-zero sum, and that led him both to respect foreign gods and to marry a lot of women. And I think, so this is a case where a polytheism uh, blends very naturally with, uh, with tolerance of, of, of peoples and a, and a tolerant view of other peoples and neighboring uh, cultures. And I think that as you move toward monotheism, um, one of the things pushing uh, the Israelites toward monotheism is a growing intolerance of, of, uh, of nearby peoples and a growing skepticism of how profitable it is to do business with neighboring peoples. Okay, so you get a kind of a, what we would call a nationalist strain that's driving the drift toward uh, monotheism. <clears throat> um, you, uh, there's kind of a, a way station that, that Israel seems to have passed through on the way to monotheism, which is called monolatry. <coughs> Uh, which, which means that, that it isn't that you deny the existence of gods other than Yahweh, it's just that you insist that they not be worshipped. Okay? So monolatry is the, 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 the confining of devotion to a single god without denying the existence of other gods. And there's a fair amount of, of, of evidence of this in the Bible, including the passage I quoted earlier about your god, Chemosh, uh, you know, uh, and so on. It's not the god they worship in that case, but, uh, but it's but they're not denying the existence. Um, and really, a number of verses that are uh, taken, I mean, first of all, there are plainly polytheistic verses in the Bible. So in Psalm, you get God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. There's a fair amount of that. There's evidence in the Bible that God was thought to have a wife, a goddess wife or maybe consort called Asherah. That's increasingly uncontroversial because archaeology is confirming that. A lot of, lot of evidence of, of polytheism. But there's also reason to believe that uh, some of the verses that we think of as monotheistic may just be monolatrous, okay? They may not deny the existence of other gods. So, here's a pretty well-known one. You know no god but me, and beside me there is no Savior. This comes from the, uh, the prophet uh, Hosea <clears throat> um, in the uh, 8th century BCE. The verb know there, you know no god but me, is the same verb that was used in ancient treaties of vassalage. Okay, so if a great power, like Assyria or something, said, you know no nation but us, that, that meant you, your allegiance is confined to us. It didn't, they weren't saying we're the only nation that exists. So that verb does not really clearly imply monotheism. Um, now here's a plainly monotheistic passage. There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is no one besides me. But that comes in the part of Isaiah, um, which scholars call Second Isaiah, because apparently Isaiah had at least two different authors. And Second Isaiah seems to have been written during the exile. And in general, uh, if you look at the kind of conventional dating of scriptures in, in, the, in the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, and there is controversy about this. There's, there's not agreement on all of it by any means. But if you look at the kind of mainstream dating, you don't get unequivocal monotheism until the exile, in, in these verses of Isaiah. Now, um, I don't think I'll spend a lot of time on the evidence I cite in the, in the book that, uh, that the drift toward monology and monotheism is associated with a skeptical view of the virtue of doing business with nearby peoples, but let's take Hosea who uttered that apparently monolatrous uh, passage and, and, and is the earliest clear-cut monolatrist in the Bible by standard dating. This is the 8th century BCE. Uh, here's some things Hosea complains about. Complains that Israel, quote, mixes himself with the peoples. Foreigners devour his strength, but he does not know it. Another quote from Hosea, the standing grain has no heads. It shall yield no meal. If it were to yield, foreigners would devour it. Uh, he complains that Israel's officials, quote, bargain with the nations. They, sh they shall soon ride under the burden of foreign kings and princes. And I argue you see this attitude in, in those who are espousing exclusive devotion to Yahweh. You see a growing skepticism of the virtue of doing business with uh, neighbors on, on, on grounds like this. Uh, it's a zero-sum perception of, of Israel's neighborhood, and they're not imagining it. I mean, it was a tough neighborhood. Israel had some very bad experiences 
uh, with dominant uh, powers, uh, culminating in the Babylonian catastrophe, but certainly not confined to that. Um, so it's not surprising that just as today you have nationalist politicians who are skeptical of free trade or whatever, you had nationalist politicians there. I'm arguing this is really centrally involved with the kind of narrowing down of, of the gods that it was legitimate to worship in Israel toward uh, Yahweh. Um, the, uh, and I argue, again, the time doesn't permit me to elaborate, but that when you get true monotheism in the exile, it's a kind of culmination of this nationalism. Um, and it comes in the wake of this complete catastrophe. The Babylonians have not just conquered Israel and subjugated it, but destroyed its temple, uh, which meant that its God had destroyed Israel's God, Yahweh, or had beaten Israel's God, Yahweh, uh, by conventional reckoning in those days. Um, and and the, the at least upper class of Israelites have been exiled to Babylon. And they, there is where they start trying to make sense of what's happened to Israel theologically. The educated classes have been moved to Babylon. And they're pondering the situation. <clears throat> um, and just to oversimplify my, my argument for the sake of time, um, I, I see the development of monotheism as kind of the ultimate revenge almost. Okay. The uh, Isaiah, who, 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 who is the one who unequivocally is the first one to be unequivocally monotheistic. Is, is in a kind of apocalyptic mode when he's doing this, okay? That is to say, he's imagining a future day when fortunes have been reversed and Israel's many persecutors will be punished and Israel will be on top. This is the essence of apocalyptic thinking. All the suffering will be over, the tables will be turned, the people who have persecuted you uh, will, will, will get their comeuppance, okay? And certainly uh, a number of neighbors have persecuted uh, uh, Israel. And if you look at the very passages where, where Isaiah is being unequivocally monotheistic, he's also really looking forward to the revenge that would be wrought on these past persecutors. So here, here's a couple of verses from Isaiah. It, it, these, this is God talking. Okay, The rulers of the various nations, quote, With their faces to the ground they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Uh, he's saying to the, the Israelites that your neighbors will, will, uh, will bow down to you. Here's another one, God talking again. Quote, I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Uh, here's one that's explicitly monotheistic, where the kind of retribution and monotheism are right together again, this part of Isaiah says of Egyptians, Ethiopians, and Sabians, they, quote, shall come over to you and be yours, they shall follow you, they shall come over in chains and bow down to you, they will make supplication to you, saying, God is with you alone, and there is no other, there is no God besides him. So in other words, this monotheism is here kind of the ultimate revenge. It isn't just that your enemies will acknowledge that their gods are inferior to yours, which would be a, a measure of payback. It's that they are going to have to acknowledge that their gods don't even exist. That's how great the coming apocalypse is going to be for Israel at this point. Um, now, as I said, I'm happy to report that I don't think you have to wait for Jesus of the New Testament for God to get into a better mood. Um, I argue that shortly after the exile, you start seeing a much more benevolent and tolerant God um, I won't dwell on this stuff at all, but I make the argument in the book, as I see we're, we're kind of running out of time. But um, the uh, it, it's, uh, well, let me jump to the explanation for it, to, to cut to the chase. Why would you see a more tolerant God after the exile? Well, what happens is the Babylonians are conquered by Cyrus the Great of Persia. He returns the exiles to Israel. They now return to their homeland. They are again allowed to worship uh, the, at their temple, uh, such as it is at the, at the point that they um, that they return, um, and they are now above all in a secure neighborhood because they're in a large empire. Their neighbors are no longer enemies. They're 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 uh, so they're surrounded by friends now, people that they can do business with, and people who don't threaten them. And I, I argue that you see a real shift if the if the conventional dating of the scriptures is right. You see a real shift between pre-exilic and post-exilic scriptures in terms of the attitudes. Uh, toward people like Moabites, um, toward the Syrians who had, who had tormented uh, Israel 
uh, extensively. I mean, at, at the at the end of uh, uh, the Book of Jonah, which is apparently post-exilic, you you the, the deal. The story of Jonah is Jonah the prophet is upset that God is going to be nice to the Assyrians. Or they call them Ninevans, but Nineveh is the city in Assyria. Uh, and and uh, and at the very end of it, God is trying to explain it to Jonah that, yes, the, the, the Ninevites, the Assyrians have strayed, they worship the wrong God, I'm going to give them a break. He says, quote, should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? Knowing your right hand from your left is an idiom that, that, that meant, you know, moral clarity. So if they didn't know their right hand from their left, they were morally confused. And God is saying, look, people are confused, give them a break. Well, this was not the attitude of God or the Israelites toward the Assyrians before the exile, I assure you. And it was generally, you know, it was often not the attitude toward people who worshipped the wrong God. So anyway, um, I see uh, the shift toward a more tolerant God after the exile as an example of what the perception of non-zero-sum relationships can do for a people. I think you see a wholly different God because you see Israelites convinced that they can profit from doing business um, with their neighbors. Uh, now, I promised to uh, say something about my own beliefs. So let me say a little more about uh, about the history of the world, and then I will be obliged to uh, to say something like that. I, all, all I would say is that this expanding realm of non-zero sumness, which accounted for the moral growth of God in this case, is, I think, built into history. Okay, my previous book, Non-Zero, was largely devoted to making that argument, that the history of the world ever since the Stone Age has consisted of the evolution of technologies that permit or encourage the playing of non-zero sum games with more and more people at greater and greater distances. Okay? Road, building of roads, uh, the invention of writing, all kinds of technologies uh, have made it possible to play non-zero-sum games with people at greater and greater distances. Globalization is a kind of a culmination of that process in a certain sense. I mean, you when you go to buy a car, you don't realize it, but you've just played a non-zero-sum game with people in countries all over the, over the world. In various, if you look at where the parts of that car were made and where they were assembled, you would realize that there's these people you don't even know, they built you a car, you are paying some of their wages. And this is, this is uh, globalization consists of these kinds of non-zero-sum relationships. Um, I believe it, it, this growth in non-zero-sumness has on balance resulted in a kind of moral progress. Not that the world has gotten better in every way, God knows, but in terms of sheer tolerance of diversity, I think things have moved ahead. Um, you know, we take for granted the fact that I think all of us in this room, I hope, would say that people everywhere should be treated decently, have basic rights, regardless of race, creed, or color. Okay? That's just the point of view in a modern cosmopolitan society, right? That's what you say. Uh, some of us, you know, we, sometimes this is honored in the breach, you know, and, 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 and we don't always live by those words, but we say them, and that alone is a big departure from the way business was conducted, you know, three, four, five thousand years ago, or a thousand years ago. Um, there has been, I think, in that sense, progress. I trace it to this expansion of, uh, of, of non zero sumness, and I'm, I'm willing to defend that if, if challenged, but the main point I would make is that. If indeed built into history is this uh, this drift toward larger webs of non-zero sumness, and indeed those lead people closer to what I would call moral truth, these webs, um, then I would say that's among the evidence you could deduce if you wanted to argue that the whole system has, in some sense, some larger purpose. That there's, in some sense, some purpose unfolding, and I want to emphasize unfolding through the material workings of the world and of history. So this this is not a departure from a, from a scientific materialism to say that there could be a physical system that has a purpose. In fact, pretty much everyone agrees there's such a thing as a physical system that has a purpose. I'm arguing, something that not everyone does agree on, that the whole system uh, of life that we've seen unfolding on this planet, including uh, human history, could be such a system that, that has purpose. And among the evidence I deduce is what I see as a kind of engine of moral uh, progress. Now, there, there hasn't been as much progress as we'd like to see. Um, 
there does seem to be emerging, uh, you know, this so-called clash of civilizations, which I think, well, my own view of clash of civilizations is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if you, if you take it too seriously, but sadly more and more people have taken it seriously. Um, in any event, we see tension along these, uh, the, these intra-Abrahamic lines among Christians, Jews, and Muslims. There's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of intolerance, so obviously there's not as much progress as we would like to see. Um, but I would, I would emphasize um, a couple of things. Uh, one is that the good news that I try to document in this book is that all three Abrahamic faiths have shown that they have the capacity to adopt, to, to adapt to a non-zero-sum uh, environment, to non-zero-sum dynamics, by summoning the requisite doctrines of tolerance. They all have it in them to respond adaptively to the very kind of world we're in, which is an increasingly interdependent world, where we are increasingly in the same boat. Okay, so I, I argue in the book that they've all shown they have it in them. Uh, the only other thing I'd say is that I don't, I don't necessarily predict success. I, I don't necessarily predict that we will summon the moral progress to keep the world together in a kind of, uh, or as an orderly and peaceful system. We may fail. But I would say this. I think if we succeed, it will require further moral progress. And I think specifically, people everywhere will have to get better at what I call moral imagination, putting themselves in the shoes of people in very different cultural circumstances from, from their own. I think that is really, literally, not to be too melodramatic about it, but that is what the salvation of the world uh, may well depend on. And I mean salvation in the kind of Hebrew Bible sense of the term, that is to say the preservation of the coherence and order of the social system. So, um, uh, oh, what am I? Is that what I haven't said yet? So I, I, I do, I think there is uh, good evidence, I haven't really made the argument here, but I do, that there is some larger purpose uh, unfolding, um, that it has a moral direction, that it challenges us morally, that it has repeatedly aligned our self-interest with moral enlightenment, um, and is doing so again. Now, whether that means there's a God, I don't know. It's certainly possible for a purposive system to be created by something other than a conscious intelligence that designs it, so that's a possibility. Um, I don't know. Uh, and, and, and on that point, I truly am agnostic on, on whether there is what, what is behind the purpose that I think there is evidence of. But I would say that in my life, just uh, the belief that there is purpose and evidence of purpose, you know, helps me uh, align myself morally, you might say spiritually, and does some of the things uh, for me that I think religion traditionally uh, does for people. Um, William James, the great uh, psychologist uh, and philosopher, said that religious belief is the belief that there is an unseen order and that our supreme interest lies in harmoniously aligning ourselves with that order. If that, you know, believing that qualifies you as religious, um, I would argue that A, I'm religious, and B, you can be a materialist. Um, and so there. <laughs> That's it. Thanks. Yes, you've already been identified as a what, materialist, a Marxist, a Wells, what else did you call it? An atheist communist. An atheist communist. Well, what better way to start the Q&A? I can't live up to that. We're told that we, Homo sapiens, emerged 150,000 years ago, give or take a year. And we're also told that there are no signs of religiosity beyond about, let's say, 100,000. So it appears that there are 50,000 years when our ancestors did not display these signs that you find in the Paleolithic. Could you say something about those 50,000 years? Well, first, I'm not among those people who are arguing that religion, per se, is in the genes. Um, so that, that's, so that's I'm not unhappy to be asked that question. I, I, you know, uh, I'm not arguing that religion has has uh, been with us since we were Homo sapiens. I mean, the way uh, an evolutionary biologist would frame the question is, there's two senses in which something can be in the genes. It can be an, an adaptation. Okay, that is to say, uh, it was it was created by virtue of its contribution to genetic proliferation. I don't think religion per se is that. Um, 
I, I think, on the other hand, if you look at the various parts of psychology, and I have the appendix of the book is devoted to this question. I do have a kind of chapter-length assessment of, of this question. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the components of human psychology that do give rise to religion, I think those are adaptations. Uh, and they include you know, things like the way we naturally think about causality and what things naturally, uh, you know, our, 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 our willingness under some circumstances to believe things regardless of whether they're true, a lot of things. I think the, this combination of psychological elements gives rise to religion at some point in the very early history of our species. <clears throat> um, but I'm not positing the beginning of religion at any one point. And I don't pay a lot of attention to the kind of archaeological evidence because by definition, before history, there's not a very clear record of much of anything, you know, a very specific record. You can look for relics and graves. I wouldn't call that a prerequisite for religion, though. I can imagine a religious people who don't believe relics and graves. So what I focus on is the, the anthropological record of observed hunter-gatherer societies. Um, and there is not one that I'm aware of, and there are hundreds and hundreds in the database, including those that were encountered in apparently a fairly pristine condition. In other words, they hadn't been much corrupted by Westerners and were studied in that condition. There's apparently not a one that didn't have something we would call religious or spiritual, although interestingly, they don't, they don't tend to identify it that way. You know, they, if you ask an undergather what's your religion, they don't know what you're talking about because it's so finely ingrained what we call religious beliefs are so finely ingrained with their way of comprehending reality that they don't think of it as a separate part of, of intellectual life. And in fact, apparently, I gather, there's no word for religion in ancient Hebrew. So even in ancient Israel, religion was so pervasive a part of your way of looking at the world that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a special thing. Um, I warned you I was going to ask this. Um, in the news that we just heard uh, about uh, Afghanistan. Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about, talk about that. I definitely okay. have an evolutionary explanation for Tiger Woods. Uh, and, and David Levin. Uh, uh, so I just wonder if you could talk about the implications of your analysis of uh, religion historically and the fluctuation between uh, belligerence and uh, tolerance for American foreign policy right now. Obviously, we are fighting a couple of wars in which religion, and particularly Islam, is a, a huge factor. Yeah. So if you have Barack Obama's year, what do you tell him as a result of your research on uh, these issues? Well, I think I need to spend less time with him than I would have had to spend with George Bush or something. Because <laughs> I, 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 I think he actually kind of gets what I think is the moral of the story. I mean, let, let's leave aside the Afghanistan question, where I think he was in a difficult political situation, a difficult just strategic situation, kind of. And, and I, I, don't, I, I don't think I can say anything related to, to this talk that bears on that really dramatically. But I do think, I, I would say, when I say that, uh, perceiving yourself to be in a non-zero-sum relationship uh, with someone is the key to treating them decently and, and with tolerance, or at least encourages that. I want to emphasize the word perceiving, okay? It isn't enough that you, in fact, be in a non-zero-sum relationship with people. So, take the, the uh, Israelis and the Palestinians. They're in a non-zero-sum relationship in the sense that if they don't work this out, things are probably going to get better for, for worse for both of them, I think. And if, and you can imagine solutions that would make life better for both of them. Um, but they're not, not treating each other especially well right now. That can be for a couple of reasons, really. One can be that, that you just don't trust the other person. You don't think there's a doable deal. Trust is a common impediment to coming, coming to good solutions of non-zero-sum problems. But the other is that often people don't uh, perceive themselves to be in a non-zero-sum relationship. And, and here maybe a better example is uh, there are probably a lot of Americans who, who look at Muslims on, on the other side of the world and, and think and don't think, hey, we're in the same boat, it's a non-zero-sum relationship. But in fact, I think it is. Uh, you know, if, if Muslims around the world get happier and happier with their place in life, think they have a place in the world, um, life's going to be harder uh, for terrorist recruiters. Um, if, on the other hand, they think they're getting a bad deal and, and, and they're not so happy, that's going to be, worse. That's gonna be um, better for terrorist recruiters, worse for Americans. So I think there are a lot of Americans who probably aren't thinking about it that way, but it is the case. So um, I, I think 
you first have to distinguish between being in a non zero sum relationship and perceiving that. And you have to be attentive to some of the cues that people use to decide whether they're in a non zero sum relationship. One of these is respect. If I, if I think you're not respecting me, uh, you know, I just instinctively, unconsciously, start moving into zero sum mode. It's unlikely that we're going to have a, a profitable relationship if I'm not respected by you. Um, and I think Obama understands that. He, 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 I mean, he says as much. He, he says to Muslims around the world, we do respect you. Now, saying that may not be enough, but I think in general it is the case that convincing people you respect them is an important part uh, of fostering peace between um, you and them. And I think, in general, powerful nations tend not to appreciate the various ways they can give signs to people that they don't respect them. You know, I mean, it, it's, uh, and this gets back to moral imagination. If you live in the richest and most powerful country in the world, and if, you know, like all nations, really, your nation kind of works hard to convince everyone that it's a fundamentally good nation and just does good things, it's not easy to put yourself in the shoes of someone in another country who believes otherwise, who believes that actually you did something bad to them, or you, you did something um, offensive to them. Uh, and yet, I, I think if you take an honest look at our foreign policy, or the foreign policy of any past great power, you would see they do things that convey disrespect to people. And the fundamental, you know, you see all the time from our smartest commentators, I read a column just uh, the other day, that was a good example uh, of people just kind of not getting that the, the rest of the world does not share our perception of America. You know, that's not to say that in every case they have a valid grievance. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, the, the first question is to just see what is their perception of things. Then you can get to the question of what the valid grievances are. But that's the, I think Obama gets that. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, that's why he wanted to stop the settlements. Uh, on the West Bank. He understood that that was just a sign of ongoing disrespect, building more and more and more settlements. And he, and he didn't win that one. Yes? To a certain degree, you said this in the book, which I enjoyed the most. Thank you. And you said, you said it today. But to a certain degree, isn't economic theory driving religion? To a certain degree. And huh. in fact, you know, we just talked about foreign policy, and isn't the fact that we're, we're giving money away and having foreign aid, that we're doing some of those things. And the second part to that question is, what about a return, do you see a possibility of a return to polytheism? And in fact, Obama's speech, just acknowledging respect for Islam, maybe it's like a first step. I'm not saying he's moving in that direction, but would that in fact help solve some of the world's problems? Let me address the, the second question first. Um, the uh, I mean, there's various theological maneuvers that could help reduce tensions among the world. When, when Obama or any, any Christian or Jew speaks favorably about Islam or tries to bring them into the fold, it's not necessarily the case that they're embracing polytheism, I would say. Because the assertion in the Quran is unequivocally that the God of Islam is the God of Christians and Jews. That's one thing there can be no doubt about if you read the book. That's what Muhammad was saying. Um, so to give credence to that uh, is not in itself polytheistic. Now, it may, may, there may be some Christians who have problems with saying that, you know, embracing a God uh, espoused by a man who did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Muhammad says a lot of nice things about Jesus. He doesn't go quite that far. but. Still, I would say um, that, that's not necessarily polytheism. And I, I, a, a doctrine that I talk about in the book that I think uh, is, is actually um, play, has played a big role in, in uh, modern Hinduism uh, that, that can be constructive in this regard is the doc, notion of the Godhead. The idea that the various gods people worship are manifestations of an underlying divine unity. And that, too, is not necessarily, it's in a way, a poly, you could say it, it's, a, it's a form of superficial polytheism, but the assertion, ultimately, is of an underlying divine unity. Um, so, uh, I think, um, you know, there are various doctrinal amendments you could hope for 
For example, in the Second Vatican, it's asserted that non-Christians uh, may be able to find salvation. That was a real departure. That's an example of a kind of reaching out to other faiths. Um, as for the first part of your question, as I understand it, to what extent are these things driven by economics? Um, the, the whole concept of non-zero Yes. Yeah. Although it's not only an economic concept. I mean, non-zero, you know, you could just say, look, uh, if this nuclear weapons situation gets out of control, we're all in trouble. So we have a common interest in doing a, a, a you know, better non-proliferation treaty than we have. That's a perception of a non-zero sum dynamic that's not economic. You could say the environment's going to help. We're all in the same boat. Um, so it's not strictly economic. Uh, the, the concept of non-zero sumness. What's fundamental is the perception that you that you can benefit by working together. And the relationship between the two parts of your questions, I think, is that the more convinced people become that they're in the same boat, the more eager they are going to be to accept these doctrinal amendments that are in some cases new and a little hard to accept, that themselves tend to exert a, a, a kind of healing effect you know, at the theological level. The top. Yeah. Um, you spoke just a short while ago uh, respect between nations, uh, really between the West and Islamic nations, um, and the cultures that are contained within those nations. But uh, I wonder what's your opinion on um, the scientific community and how it views religion, whether it should um, uh, question uh, certain assertions of religion, or should it not out of respect because. Uh, Sam Harris asserts that it is possible to become a nuclear physicist and still believe in the mechanics of martyrdom. Yeah, I think manifestly, aren't a nuclear uh, um, he, he does, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, um, I mean, there's certainly scientists who are, who are religious. I mean, as for what I think scientists should do about religion, <clears throat> I mean, same thing as anybody else. They should say what they believe. However, uh, I'm not on board with the new atheists. I mean, I am not myself. I don't consider myself an atheist of any kind. But the great majority of atheists I have no problem with. They don't believe in God. They say they don't believe in God. That's fine. What I don't like about the new atheists are two things. Um, first of all, they assert that religion is this overwhelmingly bad thing, whereas I think it is not intrinsically bad. And it's, as I tried to show, it depends on the circumstances in which it finds itself. And it, it often does good things soup kitchens all over the country being run by religious people. Um, so I think that's just an error. Uh, so Christopher, the subtitle of Christopher Hitchens' book is, I think, How, religious, How Religion Poisons Everything. Well, surely that's an overstatement. I, you know, um, I do the test, I could drink this and see if I die and if I don't. And something that religion hasn't <laughs> um, The second thing uh, that where I depart from them, it's related to the first. Because they think religion is bad, they are on their own kind of conceptual intellectual jihad to wipe out all vestiges of religion. And I think that is not constructive. It's just not constructive. I mean, I said to Sam Harris only a few weeks ago in a kind of debate that, as I understand his position, it's that the way to um, address the war on terror is to go around to radical Muslims and grab them by the shoulders and say, don't you understand, your God doesn't exist. I predict that that will not be a productive strategy. <laughs> um, you know, it's just that simple. I, just, I don't get it. I don't understand what, what it is they think about the way human nature works. And I think maybe, uh, I don't think he was brought up religiously. I was. I, I mean, maybe it, it, it's, um, you know, maybe it's a lack of understanding of kind of how a religious mindset works. But that's just not the way you build bridges with, uh, with fervent religious believers. Um, yeah? Um, you were referring to Hinduism, and uh, a colleague who is a Hindu uh, said to me some time ago, um, a Hindu, a Christian, and a Jew are all wounded. They all bleed the same blood. God didn't make a difference. Man did. And I've been thinking lately about the idea that man made the difference to the property. Um, in the Three Red Lines, the film by Terrence Malick, uh, in the midst of all the destruction, Yeah, and, and I mean, I should say, uh, 
Another reason, you know, peace and understanding hasn't prevailed, notwithstanding these non-zero-sum dynamics I keep asserting, is there really are zero-sum dynamics in the world, and one of them is, is dispute over land. In Israel and Palestine, that's, you know, part of the, the problem. Um, the good news is that the possession of land, per se, is less economically important than it used to. In terms of, if you look at the percentage of kind of GDP that, that is dependent on the sheer possession of land, well, back when farming was a much bigger part of the economy uh, and the extraction of minerals was a much bigger part of the economy, uh, this is the heyday of kind of, uh, you know, imperial belligerence. Um, land is more valuable. It's probably a good thing that land is, is less valuable now and it is, is part of what I... Uh, not that it's not worthless, and, and, and in any event, in a case like uh, the Middle East, it's really not about the economic value, ultimately, of the land. It's about ethnic identity and it's in the sense of entitlement. Um, but, you know, I do, uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not a Marxist, so I may not, may not, you know, deliver the sermon about property that you might like to hear, but I, I certainly think it's, it's one of the things that is at the root uh, of a lot of fighting, but by no means the only thing. I mean, there's also status as a classic zero-sum game, um, where you know two people can't both be the top, you know, person. That leads to to, to genuine conflict and, and so on. But absolutely, disputes over land are problematic. Do you follow? Could follow? I do, but I just wanted to say that I wasn't only referring to physical land. I was referring to the idea that when I ride the bus and I take the same seat. Um, or I have a thought that I believe is only mine. Mm -hmm. um, there's that kind of ownership as well. Yeah. Mine and a yeah. No, in academia, you see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in. Yeah. Um, in the room, as, as far as the possession of ideas. Uh, and in journalism, John and I have discovered that we now live in a world where the ownership of your information is not worth anything anyway. Uh, so uh, we're all being liberated. The truth. Uh, yes, right there. Uh, yeah, you uh, mentioned earlier about uh, it's natural human uh, part of the natural human process that when we have a rival, we tend to cast that rival in a negative light. We tend to demonize that rival. So, to a certain extent, those who demonize perhaps the Muslim world in the United States, somewhat understandable, given that, but. I was wondering if you had a reaction to this past weekend in Switzerland. They voted that no, no new minarets may be constructed within uh, Swiss territory. Yeah. And one does not necessarily think of Switzerland in conflict with anybody. Uh, so how do you explain uh, uh, this sort of demonization of Muslims and the Islamic religion in Switzerland, which does not seem to be in this quite this uh, dialectic. Well, no, the perception of zero sumness is internal. I mean, that the native Swiss feel threatened by the immigrants, right? It's a kind of a, you know, a Pat Buchananite nationalism. Um, so I think it's it's. It doesn't have to be that we're, we don't have to be talking about nation versus nation. This is an one, you know, one kind of ethnic slash religious tradition that views an, an alternative one as interlopers. They may consider them dangerous, the source of terrorism. They may just feel threatened by. Uh, it's a very common perception, and, and I would say the root of fundamentalism in general. This is one thing fundamentalists have in common. Maybe they can, you know, get together and bond over it. Is that they all. Uh, feel threatened by something, um, and uh, so I don't. I, I see that as consistent. I don't know, John. How, how uh, you uh, tell me when I should stop? Oh, I, as long as there seem to be some more questions. So, as long as you're good. Oh, I'm I'm fine. There there are always people who would like to leave and they, they feel guilty. Oh, they they feel free to leave. They, 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 as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That guy's been patient. <laughs> Okay, Where are those, who are you coming to? Like that young man over there. Hi. Do you align yourself with any philosophy? I know you said no religion, but any philosophy. And the second question, do you apply the game theory and get to things other than religion, like race or, or gender? And thirdly, do you like Frederick Bastiat, the 
the French economist who spoke about the unseen order that keeps Paris today? I can easily address the uh, third question by saying Frederick who? <laughs> the, uh, I, I do, um, you know, I certainly apply game theory to things other than religion. In fact, I would emphasize, and this is something I, I didn't emphasize clearly enough in the book, I guess, that um, in order for non-zero sum dynamics to lead to uh, what I would call a benign kind of morality, a benign view of the other, it's, it doesn't have to be mediated by religion. I think atheists who perceive a non-zero-sum relationship with someone will judge them favorably and warm up to it. Uh, religion is almost a neutral medium in that sense. Religion just happens to be the value system of religious people, so it will reflect, that it will manifest uh, this, this kind of uh, game theoretical logic but so will a non-religious value system. If you had a society of atheists, like there aren't many on the record book, but if you had one, I would expect them to uh, their morality to uh, to adjust in the same way to zero sum and non-zero sum dynamics. Was there a, there was a the third question? Yeah, or, to identify with the philosophy. Oh, you mean in their own moral philosophy, or I'm I'm more or less utilitarian. I mean, I think uh, you know my. Uh, Two books ago, I wrote a book called The Moral Animal, which was about evolutionary psychology. And one thing evolutionary psychology does is make you realize that your moral intuitions are just these products of natural selection that were designed to get genes in the next generation, so they don't obviously deserve a lot of credence, right? Um, and, and, and I think some of them are manifestly bad. So the question becomes, where do you get a morality if you are doubting all your moral intuitions? And I think the one moral assertion that stands the best chance of surviving that kind of scrutiny is just the assertion that human well-being is a good thing. If there is any, if there is moral value in this universe, I wouldn't confine it to humans necessarily. I would say subjective well-being, happiness. Um, and so you could start out uh, by saying that's good, and suffering and sorrow are bad, and you should try to increase the ratio of the, the former to the latter. Uh, and that doesn't you know, get you out of all philosophical difficulties. Some questions as to where you take that and so on, but that's my basic orientation. Up in the top? I think this last question will be on the right. Yes. I'm a pretty hard That's funny. So am I. What is it? Anybody else? Sorry. Go ahead. I think the point is that I don't read the ancient text. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's good. I, 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 I don't think you should need an ancient text to tell you to be good. Uh, although I don't think it's as easy as some would have it. As Dan Dennett talks about it, uh, you know, he, he makes it sound like, you know, okay, abandoning God doesn't give you any problem with being a good person. I mean, I just talked about how I think, for me, it's possible to construct a kind of utilitarianism that I think makes sense. But but if you talk to any philosophers who actually work in the area of meta-ethics, kind of <laughs> fundamental foundations of ethics, they're not going to tell you it's a trivial problem. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's it's as easy as some would say. It. On the other hand, uh, I know tons of atheists who are good people, so that that's good, that's fine. I don't have any problem with it. As for the empirical question of whether religion is on balance, good or bad, it's a long argument. Generally, the first line of argument coming from my side of it is to point out that if you look at the people who committed the great atrocities of the 20th century, mostly people who were pretty close to to atheists, you know, uh, Hitler, Paul Pot, people, you know. Um, so, you know, and then you can, it's a long argument. I, I, I don't want to say that, that that ends the argument, but there are also a ton of good things that have been done by people who felt religiously inspired. Martin Luther King, you know, um, it's a long argument. But but I certainly, as I, I, want, I want to emphasize again, I think, you know, uh, I don't think religious people are better than atheists. I'm not making that as an empirical point. You, you want me to cut it off? Yeah.
that change.